welcome to our new program of uh, e shikshana and uh, in this course uh, we will be dealing with electrical power quality so i am professor uma rao a professor from rv college of engineering bangalore and uh, i have worked extensively in the area of power quality and i have guided a number of uh, research scholars in the area and uh, i'll be taking you through some of the modules of this uh, subject this course and uh, my teammates are uh, dr prema associate professor from uh, bms college of engineering and uh, mrs sushmita sarkar assistant professor at rb college of engineering okay so in this first lecture uh, we will start off with the basics of uh, power quality and uh, we'll see some uh, aspects why this power quality has become important and uh, uh, what is it that's driving the market towards uh, increased quality of power and first of all how do i define it and so on so i have tried to keep my lectures simple so that you can all understand what we are doing and uh, the treatment of the course uh, will follow the flow of the vtu syllabus as per as per your syllabus so now we will start with the first module and uh, i'll start uh, uh, sharing my screen okay So the course code is 18E825 for this course. And uh, so what we will be uh, dealing with in the first module, this is the syllabus in your entire first module. So you have uh, power quality and uh, voltage quality, whether the power quality is same as voltage quality. And then how do I evaluate the power quality and what are some standard terms and definitions and some general classes of power quality problems and in this we will be dealing with the most common ones uh, being the transients and the long duration voltage variations short duration variations voltage imbalance waveform distortion and some power quality terms which you will be hearing uh, normally okay so this entire module i have scheduled it for around 7 hours of uh, lecture we'll have it in seven lecture sessions okay so in this section what we are going to study the learning objective of the first lecture would be on introduction to power quality and why do i have a renewed interest in power quality and recent developments that are responsible for power quality now the concept of quality we normally associate it either with a service or with a product right uh, supposing you go to a restaurant you say they have a, a quality service that means they're very good or with a product i buy a um, phone mobile phone and i say it is of very good quality right so the word quality itself is uh, associated with a service or with a product but what the quality means will be different under different contexts clear so it is very difficult to get one universal definition of quality and uh, in terms of something like power which is both a service and a product it's a product in the sense not like a product like a mobile or a laptop or a mouse you don't see it but it's a product in the sense that it can be delivered it can be bought and sold i can buy power and i can sell it so in that terms power is also treated as a product it's like it is like a commodity it's like a commodity and it's also a service the utility for example we are all in bengaluru our utility is bescom so what is the kind of service they give us are we satisfied with that service so power is very unique that way that in the sense it is both a service as well as as a product 
So first of all, we'll see that what is the what is this concept of power quality? How do I define it? And then we'll see why suddenly people have got interested in power quality. It's not very old. And I won't say it's too recent also. So the interest in power quality started uh, in early 2000. Okay, 2000, 2001. In fact, one of the best books ever written in power quality came out in 2000, uh, written by Matt Bullen, uh, who has done extensive work on power quality. And uh, the book is Understanding uh, Power Quality Problems. So uh, you'll get a very good insight uh, into uh, the issues with power quality. And also the other book prescribed in, uh, based on which most of your syllabus is uh, written is the electrical power quality by Dugan and his team. So these two books are sort of pioneers in power quality. OK, you can more or less get both a qualitative and a quantitative feel for what is the what are the issues with power quality. And then we'll see some recent developments uh, in the electrical uh, engineering field that has led to everybody um, talking about power quality and why now it's the responsibility of the utility to give you quality power. OK, so I'll be dealing with these topics in my uh, first lecture. Now, let us see some. I try to put some images just to you know get your attention to what some sort of a problems we have. Now, you just look, this is a very common site in India, right? Quite a few. I've seen it in other countries also. So you have loosely hanging wires. You have loosely hanging five wires. And there's not much of protection. And look at this. This is, These are all live pictures. Or pictures I have taken. Photos. They are actually photos which I have clicked. And uh, you have uh, like uh, it's a thatched hut. Thatched hut. And there is not much of protection. So there is all chances of there being a short circuit and the whole uh, hut getting burnt down. But we still do operate. Right. It's not a very uncommon site if you go into rural uh, uh, places. And you can see there are a lot of loose wires uh, hanging and some very old switches, these type of, uh, you know, cup type of switch, tumbler switches you hardly get nowadays. So this is one thing which is, uh, you know, very old and obsolete now. Or look at this, all, you know, jumbled up, all the wires jumbled up in a pole. Isn't this a very common sight to all of us? Very, very common sight. All of us, we, you can see it as you go down the road and in heavily crowded places like metro cities like Delhi, Chennai, Bengaluru, Calcutta, very common, very common. You will have a huge complex with so many shops, etc. You will have a pole and pre people will be drawing wires left, right and center and uh, very difficult to even trace when a fault occurs. That is one thing in this picture uh, that should catch your attention. And the second is. Uh, I don't know if uh, immediately it has struck you, but it must strike you. And that is the fact that I have a tree here. So I have a tree which is almost touching the lines, very close to the lines, right? And this again is a common sight. So we all know the utilities come during monsoon, just before monsoon, and we call it as pruning. They prune all the trees and you'll be so surprised. You'll be so surprised that billions, not millions also, billions, billions of dollars have been lost in blackouts that have been caused because of uncut trees. So you see what will happen? This tree is live, right? You have a sap in the tree. So this tree is like a good conductor because there is liquid inside. So whenever the tree, there are so many things that can happen. The tree can touch the live wire. So you will have a connection between directly between the wire and the ground, the overhead line and the ground. OK, that is one possibility. And the second possibility is a branch of the tree may bend and it may come across two lines. Right. So then you will have a short circuit of the line. So it is just like you have two lines and you put a conductor in between. What are you doing? You're trying to short circuit the lines. So in, in your you have studied about line to line fault 
in your course and power systems. So I can have a line to line fault. And if the if I can have a line to ground fault through the tree, single line to ground fault. And we all know how harmful these unbalanced faults are. They can cause huge currents. They can cause huge currents. And they cause a lot of voltage unbalance. Clear? And as I told you, there are incidents of major blackouts occurring across the world. And when you trace back, trace back and come to the root cause, the cause boils down to not cutting trees. Okay? And this, again, as I mentioned, is a very common sight. And this is another jigsaw puzzle here. It's like a maze. Right. You just see how the connection has been given to the fan, just taken no protection, nothing, no switch also here directly. A connection is given. So some construction activity is going on. Right. So possibly the utility normally they give you uh, what is called as temporary connection for the uh, construction sites. So there you don't, they, people, you know, who, who are constructing, they don't take uh, any precautions. So blindly, just they just keep uh, uh, drawing it and uh, just look at this. I'm sure all of us have uh, seen such uh, things happening. Okay. And this is a beauty. How are we even going to trace something? How are you even going to trace something in this uh, virtual maze which has occurred you know everything is jumbled everything is jumbled and what i'm showing you as i told you there are live photos of what is there what is prevalent clear so that is the first aspect i want to draw your attention to that we do not have proper connections very often when it comes to the consumer side so whatever photographs I have showed you, showed you, they are all at the consumer premise. They are at the consumer premise. Okay. So not, not at the generation or the transmission side. So you've all studied about GTD, generation, transmission, distribution. You have studied about that. So we are not talking of generation side or transmission side. I'm talking of the distribution side right at our doorstep. Okay. Now. Why did I put this slide? So you see there are a lot of colorful uh, uh, pictures here. So let us see what happened. What happened. So earlier we had incandescent bulbs. I don't even know if some of you have seen it uh, because it's not very common nowadays. But it was very, very popular. And even now they, uh, they use it because you get dim lights. Right? Whereas with the fluorescent, with the tube light or an LED or a CFL, the light you get white light which some people find jarring. Okay. Whereas with this incandescent bulbs, you used to get a yellowish light, which many people prefer. And even now it is used in many of the Western countries. It is still, I've seen it used extensively in hotels and other places. So these were the kind of bulbs we had. Now these bulbs, incandescent bulbs, we all know, they are predominantly resistive. They are resistive in nature. Okay. So, you know, your voltage and current will be in phase. Since they are resistive, they act like unity power factor loads. They act like unity power factor loads. Right. And we all know from so many courses in the lower semesters that a low power factor is bad for the system because with low power factor, I will be drawing more current to deliver the same active power. And therefore, low power factors are not preferable. Now, slowly what has happened, slowly what has happened, these lights have given way to this. I think all of you have seen this, and I'm sure all of you will be using it, CFLs. And then LEDs. I've just put here small LEDs. But then, you know, today you have tube lights, which are LEDs, light emitting diodes. Okay, now these are not as well behaved as the incandescent bulb. Their advantage is low power consumptions, low power consumption. But then they do have their own disadvantages. They all have driver circuits. They have driver circuits. And they will produce a lot of harmonics. I think from your course in power electronics, you know what is the meaning of harmonic right and harmonics are not desirable for the grid in your later units you'll study in detail what the harmonics will do 
So I'll be using some terms in this unit and just briefly discussing them. But in depth, you'll study in the later modules. OK, so the problem with these lighting, which we have modern lighting, that is uh, CFL or uh, LED or your uh, fluorescent lamps with electronic ballasts. Today, you don't see the big choke, you know, that heavy choke we used to see in earlier fluorescent lamps. We no longer see it. That's the ballast that's required to trigger the fluorescence. Right. But then today we have electronic ballasts. So all these are the changing load profiles, changing load profiles. OK, so they are another source of problem for us because they are not resistive and they draw non sinusoidal currents because they draw harmonics. This is another problem. Now, our TVs. So you have different TVs in the market, different TVs in the market. Now, when it comes to TV, I have an interesting uh, story to tell, which, which, which I'm very fond of, and I normally tell in my uh, course in power quality. So somewhere in late 1980s, you know, in Brazil, what they found was a lot of distribution transformers used to burn out. OK, so it happened a couple of times. And on investigation, there was a serious coincidence. These burnouts happened whenever there was a football match in Brazil. And uh, we all know Brazil is a crazy nation. They're very, very fond of football when it comes to football. They're all, they madly love football. So what used to, so first they thought it's just a coincidence the first time, but then it was very clear exactly during match time, you know, the failure of distribution transformers was very high. Then on investigation, they found that because of the match, almost all the TVs in Brazil, they were on. Everybody used to switch on their TVs at the same time watching the match. And the TVs at that time, though now the TV technology is, I mean, there's no comparison with the TVs you had in 80s. But still, it's an interesting case study. So the TVs they had then, you know, they had the CRT, uh, of, uh, CRT cubes. So they were, they used to draw a very high amount of fifth harmonic currents, OK? So these harmonic currents used to increase the temperature of the transformers, and the transformers used to fail. So you see, in the power system, very difficult to say how the problem originates, OK? I told you a tree is there. When the tree touches, it has caused There are case studies where it has caused billions of dollars of loss. How? It is not just the tree touches. OK, it will be a cascading effect. The tree touches, a short circuit occurs. Because of that, the line will get open. The line circuit breakers opens. Because the line, one line opens, another line gets overloaded. And if the overloading is high, the breakers of that line also may open, and so on and so forth. You know, cascading effects can, can take place. So you see what happened in Brazil, the example I gave you in Brazil, a simple act of switching on so many TVs simultaneously led to major failures and huge economic losses. OK, next. These are all what I have shown you here. These are all power electronic driven drives. So today we have variable frequency drives, which are called as VFDs. They all use power electronics, inverters, converters to drive the uh, motors. OK, and you've done a course in power electronics and you have already learned that all these, you know, they don't produce if you take an inverter, the inverter doesn't produce a pure sinusoidal voltage, unlike your alternator. Right. So it will provide a slightly, you know, a, a, the cheapest form of inverter will produce a square wave. So that square wave will have a lot of harmonics. So it will be uh, it will not be a pure sinusoid. A lot of early UPS we had, inverters we had, domestic inverters. They all had simple, cheap inverters, which used to provide square waves. So the moment your supply goes off and the inverter is switched on, immediately your single phase motors, your fan, duck, 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 the sound would go on because they are given a square wave. OK, so the process industries like the steel industry, cement industry, uh, rolling mills, textile, printing press, all these, you know, they all use heavy drives, 
they all use heavy drives and almost all of them today are driven by power electronic um, drive, uh, power electronic components, converters, power electronic converter. And so again, now the load profile has changed. So in this one single slide itself, I've shown you how many changes are there in the load. And do let's not at all forget our computers, laptops, how many we have, isn't it? So all these work on DC. So you have a charger for your laptop. What will it do? It will take the AC, convert it, it will step it down. Your charges are heavy, you know, because there's a small transformer inside. So it will step down the voltage and then do a conversion to DC. You'll have a rectifier, right? All your computers and all associated equipment, all associated equipment. Clear? Like your printers, laser printers, monitors, all of them, all of them, they draw non-sinusoidal currents. They draw non-sinusoidal currents. Okay, your adapters, we have, we have millions and billions of adapters. And these are all SMPS power supplies we use, switch mode power supplies. So what I want to tell is the first thing I want you to understand, what, are, you know, what is Madam showing all this for? What I'm trying to show you is that the profile of the load on the system has changed. To top it all, we have electric vehicles. Are electric vehicles a load on the grid? Definitely. I have to charge the electric vehicle. So when I charge the electric vehicle, it becomes a load on the grid. So you see the load profile has changed drastically in the system. And these loads, it's a paradox. It's a paradox. In what way? You take a computer, right? This computer corrupts. Because the monitor, the printer, the CPU, everything, they draw non-sinusoidal currents. So that's why I'm saying it will corrupt the grid. The grid is designed, planned, designed, and uh, installed to operate for sinusoidal uh, voltages and currents. So here we have equipment which are drawing heavy non-sinusoidal currents. At the same time, these equipment are also very sensitive to voltage deviations. I have to be very stringent. We all know, no? all of us know how, how is sensitive electronic components are. You go to machines lab, you can't, you, 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 I don't think any student would have burn, burnt out a machine like, a, like an induction motor or an alternator or a DC motor. But I'm sure almost all of us would have burnt out some transistors, IGBTs, diodes, whatever, while we are uh, doing some electronic experiments. So these devices are very sensitive to the kind of voltage we give to them. You can't afford it to give higher voltage or lesser voltage. OK, so I have a huge variety of uh, loads today in the modern power system. And a major part of them are electronic, either analog or digital. Digital are even more sensitive because they all work microprocessors, microcontrollers. You know, even if you take an Arduino board, I'm sure you would have done some projects with Arduino board. You'll see that if you apply a high voltage, the board goes clear. So observing all this, they have come up with some definitions for power quality. So how do I define power quality? Very simple. The first definition is any power problem. So power, you know, depends on voltage and current, right? Power is voltage and current. So any power problem manifested in voltage, current, or frequency deviations, right? It could be a deviation in the voltage. So I want 230 volts, am I getting 230 volts? I want, uh, I mean, I want a purely sinusoidal current, am I getting a sinusoidal current? I want 50 hertz, am I getting 50 hertz? Or is it mixed up with some harmonics, 150 hertz, 250 hertz, everything is mixed up in it. Okay, so any problem manifested in voltage, current, or frequency deviations that results in failure or misoperation of customer equipment. Okay, now the first thing is please remember none of us are bothered, none of us are bothered if our equipment does not fail. I buy a mobile, okay, I buy a mobile, it lasts me for 100 years. Do not 100 years, let it last for 20 years. Am I bothered about its quality? No. 
as long as it, as it is working and it is doing what i want it to do i i don't talk of quality clear so the issue of quality arises only when there's a failure only when there is a failure or i am not satisfied miss operation either there's a failure or there is a miss operation so this is one of the definitions so the other way it's defined is electrical power quality refers to maintaining a near sinusoidal voltage at a bus at rated magnitude and frequency so i it's 11 kv bus so the voltage should be 11 kv and as nearly sinusoid as possible and at 50 hertz i want it to be at 50 hertz so nearly sinusoidal nearly we use because perfect sinusoid may not always happen but nearly sinusoid and rated magnitude so 11 kv bus should have 11 kv normally whenever we talk of power quality we talk of the distribution side right so my consumer i want 440 415 volts at my transformer i must have 415 volts rated magnitude and rated frequency one more they have added in addition the energy supplied to the customer must be uninterrupted i demand i as a customer as a consumer i demand 24 bar 7 a customer doesn't have rights a consumer has rights right so 24 bar 7 i want my supply no interruptions no shedding no power cuts and i not only want it 24 bar 7 i want it to be at whatever voltage magnitude and frequency you have specified and i want it to be sinusoidal clear then one more definition i'm just giving you different ways because different people have defined power quality in different ways people means not people like you and me there there are bodies like ieee iec who are who have the authority to come out with a definition a standard definition so another definition is power quality is a set of electrical boundaries that allows a piece of equipment to function in its intended manner as intended without significant loss of performance or life expectancy so you buy a product they tell you it will last for 10 years it should last for 10 years okay so in this definition you have two things which we demand from a device one is its performance i'm specifying its performance and another is its life expectancy the duration so these are my demands as a customer as a modern customer now why did we suddenly get interested in power quality as i told you you if you look at anything around uh, you know maybe 25 30 years back you won't even find people referring to power quality so it's not just by accident that uh, you know uh, we started talking of power quality okay there are some specific reasons now let us see the first one is the new generation loads i showed you we have all microprocessor based digital controls all your process industries are automated they're automated so either they have a computer or you know processors and microcontrollers digital controllers which which control the processes and as i told you these are very sensitive they need a very good quality of supply quality in terms of what not just uninterrupted it's not just that they want 24 bar 7 no they want 24 bar 7 and in addition to that they want it to be exactly as you have specified okay these loads are very demanding otherwise the load gets damaged the load fails okay electronic loads digital loads all of this and um, next as i told you the process industry has made a transition to adjustable speed drives so all these use power electronic converters which distort the type of current drawn they all draw heavy harmonic currents they all draw heavy harmonic currents better informed customer we didn't know even i didn't know 25 30 years back when i was young i didn't know okay the tv burnt fine the tv burnt but today i know if the tv has burnt 
it is what we do earlier if a product fails an electrical product fails like say a refrigerator or a tv or a light bulb blows off we blame the product right i used to blame if a tv something happens to the tv then i blame the tv oh this i have not got a good piece right but today i know that the tv can fail not because the tv is bad because the supply i am giving to the tv is bad clear suddenly my fan starts burning so i know it's not a problem because with the fan it's a problem with the su supply i've got an over voltage or a short circuit something has happened in the system right so today the customers are aware of it the customers are aware and they are better informed and we have large integrated networks today the grids are very big in india we have a national grid where all the regional grids are synchronized and in europe small countries across countries they have power transfers so failure in one can lead to what i told you earlier cascading effect one after the other one after the other one after the other okay so that cascading effect can lead to multiple failures so these are all some of the reasons why power quality has gained impetus and momentum people are talking about power quality power quality and what developments have taken place governments have revised their laws regulating electric utilities with the intent of achieving more cost competitive source of electric energy all over all over the world globally the very regulation is changing so the distribution companies are accountable the distribution companies are accountable for the quality of power right so earlier we had what we call as a regulated market that is generation transmission distribution all these processes are in the hands of one utility which is mostly government in india we had the electricity boards in karnataka we had the keb karnataka electricity board then we have what is called as unbundled unbundled functions that means what generation is separated transmission is separated distribution is separated unbundled we have so now every every bundle in it right that is the generation the transmission and distribution they are made accountable so distribution if you see in karnataka we have the distribution companies bescom hescom escom and so on so they are responsible they are forced to maintain the grid quality so the regulations have changed the second very recent development is increase of interest in distributed generation government is promoting solar pv panels okay solar rooftops and solar farms we are even getting very very big farms like 2000 megawatt solar farm and please remember the end component connecting either solar or wind to the grid is a power converter i can't just generate energy using pv and and connect it to the grid no because it's not a constant it keeps varying so i need a power electronic converter in between as an interface and the output of the converter will be synchronized to the grid so we have lot of power electronics converters and i told you the problem with all of this is they are not very good in terms of harmonics they create a lot of harmonic issues this is one thing the third development is benchmark of power quality in one part of the world against other areas we always compare no yes so you, you i buy a car okay i am i have maruti i am not just satisfied with maruti because i say if i look if i put on the tv i see other countries they have so many other different kinds of cars so i want it so the standards have changed the standards have changed you have benchmarking for power quality which was not there earlier okay so one part of the world compares with the other so we say hey in that country they have only power cut for 4 hours in a year whereas i have 4 hours in a day and i am going to fight for my rights i am going to fight i am paying my taxes i am paying my bill on time so i want quality power clear so benchmarking has come up and indices have been developed 
to help benchmark the various aspects of power quality. As I told, how do I measure quality? Very difficult, no? How do I measure the quality? Quality is something intangible. Sometimes, yes, you can measure, but sometimes it is a feeling. You feel you have you get a very good feel, and then you say it's of very good quality. You don't know, or it could be a taste. This food is of very good quality. How do I how do I measure it? I can't measure it. It's my taste, something intangible. Clear. So wherever quality is concerned, there are intangible things. But now people have put in definite indices, saying that if you ma match these indices, then you have good quality of power. Now, another one problem we have, does utility always have a record of quality disturbances? No. They won't have a record. For example, I personally used to stay very close to a substation. My house was just hardly around 100 meters from the substation. And trust me, I have lost, I have spent so much of money repairing my electric gadgets like TV and washing machine and so on. Will the utility come to know about it because of over voltages? Will the utility come to know about it? No. Will they have a record? No. They may have a record of some major fault which has occurred and which has disturbed the utility. But what happens on the consumer side, they may not have, have records. Or if there is a malfunction of a hardware or software. So, so many of us, we know while we are working, suddenly our laptop or computer will reset. That's because of a glitch, a sudden glitch in the voltage which we are getting. Who oh, Will the utility know about it? They won't even know about it. So records themselves are no, were not available because they're not formal, okay? So uh, generally, uh, from a, a customer uh, perception, they feel that faults occur because of natural causes around 60% of the time and because of problems of the utility around 17% of the time and because of customer, that means bad, bad, product with the customer about 12% of the time and some problems created by neighbors which is reflecting on you and some undefined un, uh, problems. The, whereas the utility from their records, they feel that 66% of the time, the quality issues are caused by natural causes and 25% of the time because of the customer and hardly 1% because of utility problems. So you see there's a widely different uh, perception from the customer side and the utility side. On the whole, whoever is responsible, whether it's the customer or the utility, the end result is that the customer product will suffer and some utility products also will suffer. Like the example I gave you, the burning out of the distribution transformer. That's not with the end consumer, that's with the utility. Clear. And there was another case uh, where they were telling in, um, you know, I had a group of engineers uh, uh, for whom I was giving uh, some training and they said uh, in um, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, all the meters, they had installed digital meters and all the meters in one particular area used to periodically burn out. So there is a problem with the utility, not for the consumer. So if my TV burns out, it is my problem. So either way, it is a loss. Either way, these problems, they cause some loss to somebody. It could be to the utility or it could be to the consumer. In general, we can say they cause loss to the system because the system consists of both utility and consumer. Okay, so this is the introduction which I wanted to give you in my first lecture.